Good afternoon and welcome to the Fortress Power and Rendu Solar Storage webinar. Your presenters today are Alex Lepore, West Coast Sales Manager for Fortress Power, and Daniel Pedraza, Sales and Design Engineer for Renvu. All participants will receive a copy of today's slides and a link to the recording tomorrow. Please type any questions you have in the questions box and we will answer all your questions at the end of the presentation. So let's begin with Alex, take it away. Awesome, Jamie, thank you for the introduction here. Hi, everybody, welcome to the webinar. Uh, before we get started, I wanna thank Renview for co-hosting this webinar today. We have a lot of really great information uh, we're gonna be covering here today. Like Jamie mentioned, we will have these slides sent out after the fact. So don't feel like you have to rush through and jot down a bunch of notes as we will have these slides available for you guys. So that being said, I'm gonna get started here right away. So a little about who we are here at Fortress Power and what we do. We're a lithium iron phosphate battery provider uh, focusing on the residential and commercial markets. We're based outside of Philadelphia in a small town called Southampton, Pennsylvania. And we were founded back in 2016 and were owned by a group of investment bankers and solar veterans. As you can see here on the right hand side, this is our warehouse. It's a 30,000 square foot facility. This is where we do a lot of the R&D, sales and logistics here at Fortress Power. Now, that being said, we do have two other warehouses, one in, in California, California in Hawthorne, and we have one in Florida down in Miami. Certainly batteries are a very hot topic uh, nowadays, and we're gonna be covering later in the presentation uh, some of the applications that batteries can be used, the growth of energy storage here in the 2020s, and lastly, sizing energy storage for your particular projects. So we've seen, we've had experience and done installations, not only in the continental US, but also in Canada, the Central Caribbean, South America, Europe, and Africa. We are the exclusive lithium battery supplier for SEPTA, which is a local railway company um, outside of Philadelphia here, and Hydro-Quebec, which is a Canadian utility company using a few of our batteries in an interesting hydro battery application. So moving on, there are a lot of different ways that you can use your battery. There's not one application or one battery that can fit all the different uh, moving parts out there. So my purpose of this slide is to inform you all how you can use your battery to maximum effect. The first thing you can do is back up your facility. So per NEC code, in normal situations, if the grid goes down and there is no storage, this means that the solar will actually stop producing. So what you can do is you can have a battery to add on with your solar panels, and doing this will keep these solar panels running in the event of an outage. You can use this for self-supply. So if you're in an area where the grid is prohibiting net metering or the feedback of excess electricity, this is where it'd be advantageous to have a battery because you can store the excess solar power for later use. So you can really maximize your PV production and not miss out on extra power generated depending on how your solar is aligned, et cetera, et cetera. You can also save money on your electric bill. So in certain areas of the country, they will charge uh, a lot more per kilowatt during certain times. One example that comes to mind is in Southern California. From 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., they may charge 20 cents a kW. And then from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., they could charge anywhere upwards of 30, 40, 50, or even 60 cents a kW in some areas. So using a battery in this kind of application, it's also called a time of use application in which you charge the battery during the day, and then you can discharge it during those peak times so you're basically avoiding all of those high, high, high rate charges during those times. And the last thing to keep in mind, whether it's a self-supply application, a normal grid tied backup application, or you're using this for time of use, is that solar, especially lithium batteries, are available for many taxes and incentives, like the 26% ITC tax credit on the federal level when it's installed with solar. So keep that in mind regarding these different applications that you can use a battery for as there are many. So that being said, why are we seeing this demand in storage not only in the past five years, but even in the past three years? So the Department of Energy recently released a new analysis on energy storage, um, stationary energy storage, let's say, um, towards the end of this decade. 
They found that by 2030, stationary deployments will exceed 150 gigawatt hours. This means that we'll have 27% annual growth for grid-related storage applications. And you might be asking, what is this? What is the largest market for you know this global energy storage um, growth? The largest market is North America at 41.1 gigawatt hours. So if you look at this, this graph over here on the right hand side, you'll see um, where Fortress is on the grid related storage, stationary storage applications. In 2021 here, to the end of this decade, we're gonna look at growth eight times, even nine times over from the end of this decade. And this is global annual, annual stationary source projections by the sector. So grid related would be us. If you wanna check out the Department of Energy Analysis, just click down here and it'll take you right to the link. So there's, I think there's three main factors that are contributing to this exponential growth in batteries um, to the end of this decade. The first thing is the battery affordability. So as you guys probably know, in the past 15 years, the price of solar has drastically dropped because of economies of scale, better technology, et cetera, et cetera. And it's fallen over 20% alone in the past five years. So not only is solar becoming more accessible, but now batteries obviously being tied into that are becoming numerous. And by 2029, they're expecting a 46% price reduction in the lithium battery cells. So not only will this economies of scale kick in, the battery technology is gonna get better and higher quality, but there also is gonna be a price reduction, which is why they're anticipating this very, very, very fast growth of energy storage. There are a lot of new rising incentives, like the 26% federal ITC tax credit, which, which was now in, uh, extended till 23. And there's a lot of statewide incentives like the SGIP incentive, the GMP incentive, and many other statewide rebate programs. And the last thing I think is a shifting mindset on energy storage. The first thing is fear. I think we all have seen the terrible situation that took place in Dallas last week, uh, in Texas particularly, with those crazy snowstorms. So I think power is more important than it's ever been. And people are starting to realize that having a backup to their home, whether it's a generator or a battery, is more important than it's ever been. The second thing here is this high emphasis on renewables, right? With climate change and studies proven that climate change is affecting our environment, people are becoming more conscious of thinking greener, thinking cleaner, and moving away from traditional generator options and looking towards solar and, and storage, um, which can both be recycled in that kind of way. And then the last thing is this uh, political administration charge. I say this in meaning that obviously with the newest political administration change, there's a lot of push for clean energy, especially um, in the next four years and, and maybe even in the next eight years. So not only there's certainly other things in the system that contribute to the growth of renewables and storage in particular, but I think these three are ones that you're gonna wanna look out for, the battery affordability, rising incentives on the federal or state level, and then the shifting mindset of people as they move away from traditional fossil fuels to renewable sources. So that being said, here are some of the battery options we provide here at Fortress Power. I'll start off with our LFP 5 and 10 here on the left-hand side. These are two of our older products that we had um, that are used, that can be used for smaller storage applications. Now, over here on the right, you have the Evolt 18.5 and the E-Flex 5.4. The Evolt 18.5 is the big brother to the E-Flex. And the cool thing about the Evolt is that it can stack up to 12 for 200 kilowatt hours. Now, please note here that all of our batteries are lithium iron phosphate, and they're at a 48 volt level. So 48 volt batteries at lithium iron phosphate, and this Evolt 18.5 is really meant for the small residential, even into the small commercial space. Some of the key features here is it comes with this LCD display. So the end user will be able to see the voltage of their battery, the current input and output of their battery, along with how much power and KW they're pushing. It's a really neat feature that people allows people to really look inside their battery right on the front screen. Like I said, this can parallel up to 12 for 200 kilowatt hours, and it's compatible with most of the hybrid inverters on the market. I'll touch base on that a little bit later in the presentation. Now over here on the right, we have the literal, littler sibling to the Evolt, the E-Flex 5.4. So the E-Flex is our newest product, and it's a more modular approach than the Evolt. 
obviously has a smaller uh, form factor, 5.4 kilowatt hours. It's stackable up to 15 to go up to 80 kilowatt hours. The neat thing with this is that it is a little corny, but it is a very flexible unit in terms of where and how you can install it. So you can use this in your typical regital, uh, residential energy storage installations or in commercial and industrial power backup applications, railway, telecommunication applications, military applications, and off-grid applications. It can also be wall-mounted, floor-standing, or put into a shelf-mounted solution. So depending on the, the project that you're working on, and the scope of that project, you can certainly consider the E-Flex, whether it's a railway application that needs to be on, in a standard server rack, or if it's just a residential energy storage backup where they might just put it on the wall or just stick it on the floor. Some other cool features about the E-Flex is this data logging capability. So this does have closed loop communication with some of the hybrid inverters that we're compatible with. And it also has a Wi-Fi monitoring app that we'll be releasing here probably uh, mid Q2 or so. That being said, a lot of the um, hybrid inverters on the market these days do have monitoring functions. So if you have questions about monitoring your battery, most of the hybrid inverters have a monitoring function where you can see what's going on live in your battery system. So here are some brief technical specifications on our product line that we have. We have the E-Vault, E-Flex, the LFP10 and 5, and then the LFP5 24 volt. Just wanted you guys to note that the 24 volt solution is a more custom solution. So if you guys do have questions on this one, feel welcome to shoot us over an email about that. I'll have my contact information at the end of, at the end of the presentation. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but a few key things to mention here is all of our batteries are 48 volts. You'll see the parallel stacking of the Evolt is 12, the E-Flex is 15. You can stack only two of the 10s together and three of the LFP5s. So that's why I said anywhere from your smaller residential to small, com uh, small commercial is really our bread and butter. Another key thing to note here is that we have a 10 year warranty on all our products in the United States in up to 6,000 cycles. So this assumes that if you're cycling your battery one time a day, that you're gonna get anywhere from 12 to 15 years of life. Now there is one thing that you should always be cautious about when choosing a battery, whether it's Fortress Power or another provider, is the amount of cycles they provide with their warranty claim. There are other battery providers out there that give a 10,000 cycle rating for their 10 year warranty. Now this is certainly a good marketing tactic, but at the end of the day, this is also assuming that the life of the battery is anywhere from 25 to 30 years, which is really is not realistic. So although our cycle life is just 6,000, it's a more realistic and conservative approach with how you are gonna use the battery at the end of the day. So now I want to go through some of the different battery technology comparisons, whether it's a lithium iron phosphate, a lithium ion or NMC, um, and, even, and even lithium polymer. But first we jump into that, there's one really important thing um, outside of chemistry to consider when choosing your battery, and this is the battery management system. So most batteries like the LFP5 and 10 are a MOSFET based BMS. So what does this mean? It means essentially that it's the brain of the battery that's going to protect it against overcharging and deep discharging, overheating, OCPD, short circuit and open circuit protection. It will have that cell monitoring and balancing. Now we take it a step further with our EVOD and EFLEX and use this contactor based, also known as a relay based battery management system. So it has all the features of the MOSFET based BMS, but it's just a more robust BMS in terms of the communication with different inverters that we have, the communication between the units in parallel and having that remote monitoring feature. One other key feature, um, whether you're considering batteries like the LFP5 and 10 or E-Vault and E-Flex is the cell type within that particular battery. So for example, the five and 10 use a cylindrical cell, which is pretty standard and the Evol and E-Flex use a prismatic cell. The main difference is the shape of the cell. The prismatic cell is shaped like a square, which means you can fit more in the same amount of area than the cylindrical cells. And they're a little bit more robust and they can handle a little bit more current just because of the way the cell is set up. So if you are considering a battery, it's certainly a good question to ask what kind of cells are in this battery so I know more about what I'm investing into. So like I mentioned before, we have Fortress Power using the lithium iron phosphate, also known as lithium ferrophosphate, LIFEPO4 chemistry. There are other providers out there like Tesla or LG Chem that use lithium ion or nickel magnesium cobalt. 
And there's also lithium polymer out there on the market as well. Some key features of the LFP chemistry is first and foremost, it's, su it's superior safety. We've all heard the bad press about the Tesla systems and LG systems being subject to thermal runaway. So granted, it definitely makes sense for Tesla to use an NMC battery for their electric car because obviously they need a, a very dense battery to move that car from point A to point B. But in terms of stationary energy storage where this is in or near somebody's home, the safety fact is probably the most important thing to consider when choosing a battery for your project. The second thing is that lithium iron phosphate is much more eco-friendly. These batteries can be recycled. There's a company out there called Battery Recyclers of America and they have three EPA rated facilities in the US where you can recycle lithium iron phosphate batteries all the way down to the cells and even the aluminum in the battery case itself. I mentioned the thermal stability of the LFP is much better than that of the NMC chemistry and the life cycle rating. So we guarantee a 6,000 cycle life cycle rating while the NMC chemistry in a, in, a, in a good setting would maybe get 3,500 cycles. So the degradation rate of LFP is less than the NMC or lithium polymer, but it's, it is not as energy dense. So you'll typically see uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries are a little bit bulkier, they're a little bit heavier, but when it comes to safety and having this in near somebody's home, then it certainly makes sense to go with LFP. Now, if you look at lithium polymer, this is kind of like the uh, battery in your phone, right? So this is not very popular in the industry. However, um, in certain applications, it could make sense, you know, but it just doesn't have that safety like the LFP. Uh, it's very hard to recycle. The same thing with cobalt because of the added element of cobalt or polymer. And then as well as the thermal stability is just not really up to par with the LFP. So I'd say generally LFP is really the gold standard for energy storage in terms of the chemistry that batteries are using, which is why a lot of battery providers are transitioning to having LFP batteries for stationary storage applications. So keep this in mind when choosing your next battery, chemistry is definitely, definitely important. One thing I like people to check out if they do have questions or concerns about their battery is this LFP versus NMC nail test video. So you can see here essentially what they do is they take a 10 penny inch nail and drill it through the cells themselves of a lithium iron phosphate and a nickel magnesium cobalt. You see here on the left, you have the lithium iron phosphate technology where they drill the nail through. You will see some smoke you know, throughout the video, um, but nothing too substantial. Now on the right, we have an NMC cell. This, this is kind of like the cell an LG Chem would use. They do the same kind of test here and you can see throughout the video it goes full on apocalyptic um, and essentially it blows up. So I like to show this because a lot of people on, on, like I mentioned, I'm out of Philadelphia, people in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania who may not know the differences between two lithium chemistries can really help them understand that lithium iron phosphate really is a much safer chemistry. And to prove that we can drill a nail through the cell itself with no catastrophic effects. So if we look at all the different battery technologies um, from LFP here on the left to lithium ion, to lithium polymer, flooded lead acid, AGM and nickel iron, there's a few things that stick that stands out on the LFP side. The first thing is this energy throughput. Energy throughput is the amount of energy that as a, a battery is expected to store and deliver throughout its lifetime. So it's usually measured in megawatt hours. You can usually find this on the battery company's warranty letter where they'll have the megawatt hours that can be expected. So you'll see LFP has 47 megawatt hours of throughput. The only one even remote, remotely close to that 47 megawatt hours is the nickel iron battery here on the right hand side. But the key difference, look at the cost of a 10 kilowatt hour battery from LFP to nickel iron, almost three times the amount from LFP to nickel iron for a similar energy throughput. So if you look at the cost, of, the cost across the board, it is certainly more expensive than lithium ion, but when you break down the amount of cycles at 80% DOD, for example, 6,000 versus 2,800 right here on the right, the cost per kilowatt hour is half of that of the lithium ion and is only really comparable with the nickel iron, but Let's remember for the 10 kilowatt hour battery, you're paying almost three times more. 
And the round trip efficiency is a lot higher as well, which is the efficiency of the solar to the panels, to the battery, and then back to the load. 98% is very high by any standard. And that's the benefit of using LFP is that there's not a lot of efficiency losses. Like we saw in the, in the video on the slide before, the LFP is a superior chemistry in terms of safety, and there is no maintenance associated with lithium in general, whether it's LFP, lithium ion, lithium polymer. Um, obviously, with flooded lead acid and nickel ion, you need to either refill your batteries after a certain time if they're low, and there is maintenance required on these kind of solutions. So the key thing here with LFP, there's no maintenance. It's very safe. You're going to get the maximum bang for your buck when investing in LFP battery for your home, business, et cetera. So here we're going to go over a design guide for PV and storage. There's already, there's already so many questions about how do I size a battery for my home? How do I size a battery for my business? What tools can I use to get me in the right direction? So the first thing I think we need to consider is this AC versus DC coupled solution. That's where you're gonna start when you're sizing your battery. Whether it's an AC coupled solution, which is when you're retrofitting to your existing PV system, or whether it's a DC coupled solution, where it's a brand new solar installation, and you don't need any additional PV invert inverter. So for example, if we, if we were using Fortress Power in this example for AC coupled, let's say they have a solar edge inverter. The solar edge is not compatible with Fortress, because remember, Fortress Power has a 48 volt battery and solar edge is high voltage. So what you would need to do is essentially you have the existing solar edge system, you AC couple to a hybrid inverter, and then you can connect that to our battery. This is definitely uh, the more popular application, especially in the US, because a lot of you know, the uh, solar edge um, end phase systems have very, very good monitoring platforms, things like that. But a lot of people wanna stick with the phosphate chemistry, which those companies may not have available. And then we look at DC coupled solutions. This is where we see um, a lot of success, especially with hybrid systems, true hybrid systems, let's say, that are adding a battery on. So this is where there is no additional PV inverter needed, and it is certainly more efficient because you don't have all the pieces of equipment um, to make that frequency shift down to 48 volts. So the first thing you got to figure out is, okay, my AC coupling this or my DC coupling this? What application am I going to use this for in respect to this? And then you're going to be deciding upon what inverter you want to use. So we're compatible with most of the hybrid inverters on the market. So you know brands like Schneider, Outback, Magnum, SMA, Solar, Victron, Morningstar, and Midnight. And we're establishing that closed communication with Solark, Schneider, and now the SMA inverters. I did mention that data logging feature of the eFlex. That data logging or data communication is the closed compatibility with the Schneider and the Solark. What this essentially means is that it's going to make your installation two things. One, it's going to make it easier because there's no manual inputting of settings as they're already going to know where those settings are programmed or pre-programmed, let's say. And the second thing is that the battery and the inverter are going to talk with one another um, all the time. So there is such thing as open loop communication, where the inverter measures the battery by voltage, but that closed loop communication really dives into the nitty gritty details between the battery, uh, battery bank and the inverter system. So you see some here are just AC coupled, some are just DC coupled. So depending on your project and that application, like in this slide, you can pick a proper inverter um, depending on your experience and obviously also what the customer needs. So we do have a sizing tool and this is a, a, good, um, a good start to sizing your battery. Let's assume this is for backup only. So you're gonna select the loads to be moved from the main panel to the backup panel or the critical load panel, the essential loads panel, a lot of synonyms. Calculate the daily usage of that backup load panel, select the battery bank size, and then estimate the daily available power. So why sizing is so important? Because let's assume it's, it's in a backup situation, right? And you undersize the battery, whether it's accidentally or maybe they didn't want a big battery to start with. What you'll see is that if the battery is undersized, then obviously if the grid goes out and the homeowner starts flipping on all their loads, the battery is gonna shut off and you're gonna, be, you're gonna end up over promising and under delivering. Now on the flip side of that, if you're oversizing a battery or oversizing an inverter um, to the solar array, there could be problems if there's an inrush of current as the BMS will then shut off the battery to protect the battery cells. So sizing is a critical, critical important to size uh, to installing a battery.
One thing I like to use as rule of thumb, especially as battery manufacturers, is you size the battery for double the size of the array and inverter. So for example, if you have a 9KW array, you are gonna want around an 18 kilowatt hour battery. Now granted, you could always add more storage at a later date. Most, most manufacturers recommend within one year of that installation. So you can always start off with the minimum size, let's say it's 118.5 uh, eVault, then you could always add more eVaults on at a later date. Now with our systems, you cannot mix and match. So keep that in mind, you have to use like models with like models. You couldn't put on four eFlexes and then an eVault or flipped. Keep that in mind that like models should be used with like models. And then here are some different sizing resources to get you on your way. So first thing is the Fortress Power Resources webpage. We also have the Fortress Power YouTube channel, a lot of sizing and installation guidance on the YouTube channel. Energy Sage has a very good sizing tool on their platform and, and along with Energy Toolbase. These links are clickable. So when you do get the presentation sent tomorrow, feel welcome to click through there. There's a lot of good resources on all four of these websites to get you in the right direction. So that being said, I'm gonna pass it over to my counterpart, Daniel, over at Renvu, as he has some very interesting things on their side of things. Daniel, I'm passing it to you. Thanks. Let me make sure I have my screen set up here properly. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Daniel. I am a sales engineer at Renvu. Um, I is my correct screen sharing? Sorry, I just want to make sure. Perfect. All right. Um, Renvu was founded in 2021 uh, based out of Mountain View, California, which is close to San Francisco. Uh, we have a fulfillment centers on the West and East Coast, as well as Texas, uh, to service the center of the United States as well. We do also uh, ship internationally if you have international projects in your in your pipeline. Uh, something that is very unique about Renvu is our entire sales team has an engineering background, which allows us to go into depth on projects with our customers, whether it be smaller residential DIY projects up to larger commercial projects. At Renvu, we just don't sell the product. We help our customers and assist them with any technical uh, expertise and are able to support you during your installation, commissioning, and even post-commission uh, issues that may arise. We do offer additional services, including the Megawatt Club membership, which includes free shipping for all of your orders for an entire year. Uh, we do have discounts on engineering services and permit packages as well within the Megawatt Club membership. We do offer those engineering services to our customers that are not Megawatt members as well. Uh, those are just not discounted. We do have multiple online tools and that, that, that are accessible on our website that can assist you in creating your own system design, adding a battery to your system, and even calculating inner row spacing uh, due to shading. We offer financing options for larger orders uh, through uh, third parties, and these are on a project by project basis. Something Renvu is really excited about is the Bleakier carport. The Bleakier carport is a very exciting technology innovation because it brings a unique solution to residential carports with its simple yet sturdy design and its ease of installation and compatibility with solar equipment. The two-car carport can support 24 60-cell modules or 18 72-cell modules. Both configurations do utilize Iron Ridge XR100 rails. That's gonna be the same across both. It is also a sealed surface using T gaskets uh, in between the modules for waterproofed carport. Bleakier designed this carport to be easy to install, only requiring a pier depth of two feet and can withstand a 30 pound per square foot snow load and a 120 mile an hour wind load. The carport stands nine feet tall with a five degree tilt with a peer-to-peer -peer length of 18 feet on all sides. So it's a perfect square. It does not matter which direction the car enters from, meaning you can orient the array to the best solar resource available if need be. A decorative mesh is included to hide the wiring on the underside of the array if desired. And we do have a commercial option that is essentially 
two of these or however many of these carports that would share the common column in between each one of these arrays and cascade down the parking spaces. The best part about all of this is that it comes as a kit that will fit on an 11 foot pallet. A few options that Renvu is offering right now includes the standalone carport with racking and mounting hardware just by itself. That's you. That's the one you're going to see on the left. We also are offering a carport with 60 cell 310 watt modules. Uh, right now, those are the Phono Solar 60 cells with N phase IQ7 microinverters. And then we also have a carport with the same micro, or not microinverters, sorry. The same modules with a Solar 12K hybrid inverter and the Fortress Power Evolt uh, 18.5, which was talked about quite a bit in this webinar. Um, please contact our sales team um, if you do want to look into Bleak here on the commercial side and have a package built up for you there as well. Uh, Bleak Gear does have an authorized installer program that requires an application and three installations. After these steps, if you install five of these carports per month, tabulated quarterly, so what would that be? You know, five, five carports per month over the course of three months, and, and that if, if the first month you only install two, then the other months can make up for that as well. Uh, you will receive $1,000 per carport installed, as well as customer leads from Renvu, um, and you can unlock SPAs and partner benefits as well. On the, Re on the Renvu website, we do have a design tool um, that is seen here that actually includes the solar kit guide right now, or includes the Bleak Gear carport right now. It's really handy and you can change your system type to grid tied, uh, battery backup or off grid, go through and select uh, many different selections um, change your panel, um, change your manufacturer, and then from here we, we actually walk you through the steps needed to properly size a, a PV system. We can look at your average monthly electric bills or you can input those on your own. You can also select your roof mounting system if you want a carport as well. This is something that is really unique with this this tool. You can change your inverter manufacturer and then we actually list the compatible batteries underneath those uh, energy storage systems or hybrid inverters if needed. You can also go in and change your loads and we can look at each individual load that you wanna apply and cover with your solar, whether that be you know, your kitchen loads or heavy AC loads or, or heating loads as well. From there, you're gonna follow down a few more pages and you can even add in car chargers for that carport um, and a full permitting package as well to get through your AHJ and your utility company. At the end of this, you know, we'll, we'll give you a list of everything that you need. And then at the top, there's a big orange button that will send the quote over to one of our sales engineers and we'll contact you and get your project on the way. Uh, if you guys have any other questions, please feel free to ask during our Q&A session. Uh, I'm gonna give it back over to Alex. Perfect. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, I'll open the floor up for Q&A now. Um, the question, it's on the question tab down there. Just feel welcome to throw in your questions and we will uh, be glad to help. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, the first question is from Francisco. Does the eFlex come complete with inverter and monitoring functionality? It's a good question. Uh, the eFlex will just be the battery. So you will need to get one of those hybrid inverters I had mentioned before. Um, but when we release the monitoring on it, the consumer monitoring that will come with the unit, you know, mid Q2, late Q2 or so. Okay. Uh, David wants to know if we have a warranty for Canada. I'm assuming this is for Fortress Power. 
Yep, we do have a warranty for Canada. I believe it's 10 years. However, uh, I would want to confirm with you I don't cover that territory, but I do believe it's 10 years um, if you properly have sized this system and have read our warranty letter. Okay, uh, Brett is asking, can we get a contractor-based BMS on LFP5 and LFP10? That's a good question. Um, I think theoretically we could. Um, I don't know if that's something Fortress is looking to do as of now, because we do have the E-Flex unit um, with the E-Vault. So the simple answer is theoretically, yes, but I don't know if that's something Fortress will be doing down the road. Okay. Um, round trip efficiency is more related with battery type or inverter will contribute more impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I agree with that because um, it does depend on the inverter. So 98% does take into account the battery. So um, the person who sent in that question in is correct. It does depend on what inverter and the efficiency of that inverter as well. But for just the battery, 98%, assuming all things being consistent, I would say that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Chris is asking, what is the benefit of closed loop communication and what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the alternative would be open loose open loop communication sorry uh, the benefit of the closed loop communication is that if you're an installer and you want easier installs you don't want to spend a lot of time manually inputting parameters on one end as well as having the battery be able to communicate the battery bank communicate with the inverter that's ultimately the benefit of it to have a, a very seamless system that communicates on a very deep level now granted Open loop communication certainly works very, very well. But if you want that, you know, that's like the, uh, you have the basic option maybe, and then the, that'd be considered the luxury option. Now, not verbatim, but that would be the, the differences between them. Okay. Have a Renbu question here from Brett. How many modules can the Blicker carport handle? So the bleak here carport can handle 24 60 cell modules and 18 72 cell modules. Uh, now, if you're going to cascade those carports in the commercial setup, then we can, you know, build upon there. But the, the, the two car carport uh, is set up to handle, again, 24 60 cell and 18 72 cell modules. Okay. Uh, James is asking, how many days autonomy can you expect by doubling the array size for battery sizing? It's a good question. Typically, batteries are sized on a two-hour charge and discharge rate. Now, that being said, depending on the array size and your potential battery, um, it could be anywhere from up to three to five days. And I've seen projects where it even goes longer than five days because the size to solar with the battery, and then depending on their location, they'll just have the solar continually charge the battery throughout the day. If let's, you know, we're assuming that the grid has been down for a few days or a week or something along those lines. So usually standard is usually for two hours, but that being said, depending on your solar array size, the battery and the application, that can certainly change and, and definitely be increased. Okay. Daniel, uh, Brian is asking, are you planning on engineering higher win ratings for a bleak year? Yeah, so we can change the engineering of bleak year to accommodate higher wind loadings. And if they're, especially in Florida, I know they, they have a lot of issues with high winds. Uh, we can accommodate higher wind loads. Uh, if you want to send us your information at info at renvu.com, uh, we'd be glad to know what wind loads you're interested in, and if that is something that we can uh, accommodate with Bleaker. Okay. Uh, Alex Joseph is asking, do your batteries work with old models, SMA, such as Sunny Boy 6000, installed in 2009? Hmm. I think it would be, you'd have to probably use the Sunny Island series, the Sunny Boy of the SMA, I believe is high voltage. So you, you may have to use the SMA Sunny Island to make that. Um, off the top of my head, I would think that if you had the Sunny Boy, you put on the Sunny Island, then you could certainly connect our battery. The one thing you may want to do just for your own sake is see how much life is left on your current SMA Sunny Boy. You know, a lot of these inverters, um, they have maybe a 10-year warranty or maybe plus. So maybe if you're considering adding batteries, um, 
In the meantime, you can consider looking at a new inverter if it is coming on, you know, a little bit over 10 years old. Okay. Uh, Wendell is asking that um, a few inverters were mentioned during the webinar with Fortress Products. What is the system? What if the system had the Enphase micros? Would this work with the Evolt AC coupled? That's exactly right. So um, if you had an AC, if you had Enphase up on there, or AP Systems is another very good uh, microinverter brand, you would just AC couple like the Solar Converter or the Schneider or SMA or Outback to that Enphase system. And then you could connect one of our battery options, Evolt, Deflex, et cetera. Okay. Um, another question, does the battery come with temp sensors? It does. So that would be a function of the BMS. The battery management system has a temperature sensor. Now we do recommend um, temperature ranges between 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 113 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're in an area where um, it gets really cold, cold has an has worse impact on batteries than the the latter like extremely hot so if you're in an area where it gets very cold i'm talking the northeast the northwest canada then you may want to consider adding a space heater into the system and trickle charge a space heater to keep the ambient temperature warm or i've seen um, another thing is like heat strips these heat strip applications to keep the ambient temperature warm for the battery to stay in that range now since the evolve for example is indoor rated Nine out of 10 times, you won't need to do that. But if you are in a place where it's maybe in a shed, outdoor, in an enclosure, just keep that in mind for that temperature range. And the same thing with elevation. We recommend that anything above 10,000 feet, above, above sea level, that you kind of scale back on the charging and discharging. The reason I say that is because of the lack of air. It can be hard to cool in some instances. So I always recommend if you're above 10,000 feet sea level to scale back your charging and discharging because of that. Okay. Uh, Daniel, I'm going to combine these two questions here. Uh, so if somebody's asking if the carport, is the carport available for higher winds, hurricane zones? And Dean is asking if he can get a carport for 130, 140 mile an hour wind loads. Yeah, so the carport is, I mean, hurricane winds are, you know, we're looking at 200 miles or 180 mile an hour winds on, on those larger hurricanes. And that is something that we are working on at the moment. Uh, the, I, I know the engineering, the, the original engineering package has the carport rated at 120 miles an hour. I know there is uh, developments of the carport being rated at 170 miles an hour. Um, I do not believe we have the complete engineering on that yet, but that is something that will become available in the near future. We do have the ability to uh, modify and and uh, create custom orders for the bleak here carport as well. So if wind loading is something that is very uh, desired that that is something that that is available okay great um alex kathy is asking are there any special issues or considerations to be aware of when using a span panel instead of a critical loads panel uh kathy i would recommend um i actually don't know I would recommend, um, if you can see our screen here, um, the sales at fortresspower.com, shoot in your question there and I can get it off to one of my applications engineers because I do not know and I wouldn't want to give you wrong information. Okay. Emilio is asking, how do I parallel two E-volts, 18, 18 kilowatt hour batteries? Do I do it with an RJ45 data cables? That's exactly right. So if you had two of them, you would just make your positive to positive and negative to negative connections. And then there is an RS and RJ485 communication port on the top. So you would just basically run them in parallel as to be recognized as a bank and then connect it to the inverter. If you're connecting, let's say, six of the EVOLTs, then I would recommend you getting a bus bar from somewhere like Reliance. They have a thousand amp bus bar that you can take a look at for landing your connections for projects you know, with many e -volts. So if it's just like one or two, then you could just run parallel to parallel. Your communication cords will go parallel to parallel into the inverter. Anything larger, definitely consider a bus bar. Okay. 
Um, we have Glidden is asking, he is from Puerto Rico and interested in the eVault 18.5. I need to, do I need to take any certification to install this battery? What's needed to have full warranty without any problems? Mm -hmm. There's a few things that you can do. The first thing is if you want to email our warranty at fortresspower.com with your proposed system design, they can confirm whether or not your battery would cover under warranty. Second thing that you can do is go onto our website, fortresspower.com, go to the resources tab, check out our warranty letter on page eight, it'll be appendix B. On that page, you will see an inverter and battery sizing guide that my application engineers have created as you know, a minimum sizing requirement for all the different inverters we're compatible with. So you'll see Schneider, Outback, Solark on there and the whole nine um, on page eight on the warranty letter, appendix B. Okay, uh, James is asking, what is the average price per kilowatt for the newer Fortress batteries? Yep, the average price per kilowatt for the E-Flex, let's say, let me do some quick math. Um, It's around like $800, or not $800, like $720 a kilowatt hour. Um, usually is that that's what it goes for retail. Okay. Do you ship your battery storage units to the UK? Yes, we have. Okay. Um, for a 14 kW array, what is the recommended Fortress battery configuration? I would recommend going with either two of the E-Vaults, because that will give you 30 kilowatt hours of usable capacity at 80% depth of discharge. Or if you don't want to look at the e vaults and you want to take a look at the E-Flexes, oh, that comes to around, you could probably do six of the E-Flexes. Um, depending on the project, I could recommend either or, but two of the e vaults or six of the E-Flexes. Okay. Is it possible to have communication between the e vault and the Outback Radian? I think as of now, it's just open loop communication. I don't, I'm honestly not sure where we're at with testing for the closed loop communication with Outback, but we do have open loop. I do know where there was a discussion to have the closed loop communication with Outback. Um, but if you send your message to sales at Fortress Power, I can probably get a more concise timeline on when that will be. Okay. James is asking, can you discuss battery use with micro inverters? Right, so it's going to be used the exact same if you had a string inverter. You're just going to be able to get the benefits of using a microinverter when you're AC coupling it. So you're going to have the microinverter system, which will have, let's assume it's end phase, it'll have like the optimizers and it'll have the module level uh, monitoring. But at that same time, it'll be able to do the same function when hooked up to the string inverter and then our battery. It's not really a, a big change per se, it's just that extra piece of equipment when you're in that AC coupled format. Okay, Hank is asking, what do I need to do with the higher temperatures like in the desert? Yeah, in the desert, that's a really, so if you see constant temperatures above 113 degrees Fahrenheit, I would recommend a system of ventilation or a, um, the funniest one I saw was they had a very large fan that blew in front of the battery. Now you don't have to do anything like that, but I have recommend there's different ventilation strategies that you can take, um, or you make sure that if you are expecting very high temperatures to maybe just keep it inside um, instead of like in a garage. I know some places, you know, like Arizona, um, where the temperature in a garage could get up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit easily, maybe in that situation, depending on your footprint of your home, where you can fit this battery, you put it inside, add a ventilation um, structure essentially, or something along those lines. Okay, let's see if we have, um, I think you guys got pretty much everybody. Um, if, you, if anybody else has any further questions, I'm gonna leave the line open for another minute or so. Great. And I was just going to say, um, everybody, thank you again for joining. Uh, Daniel, thank you again for hosting this webinar with me. It's a very interesting webinar. I'm interested in the Bleaker uh, Solar Carport now. Um, if you're welcome to reach out to me directly, this is my contact information. Uh, here's our sales email. Like, Kathy, you can send that information to sales at fortresspower.com. 
any technical support questions when you get your battery, and any warranty questions or warranty registrations can go here. And then the same thing with Renvu. They can be reached here at their info email, um, and they also have a lot of other sizing tools, sizing guides that even I've used occasionally um, when I get myself in a pickle. Great, Alex. Thanks so much for having us on, on the webinar. Uh, we, we, we like your product a lot, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you. I have one question here coming up uh, from Sergio. I have my eFlex 5.4 connected to a Schneider gateway. Can mm -hmm. I remove from there and connect it to the Zambus? I have my, e uh, yeah, that's the question. Sergio, so send that down to tech support at Fortress Power. Um, I'm not sure what they would recommend. They may, there may be able to way to do that, but definitely send your message to tech support. They'll be able to basically walk you through if you're able to do that, how to do that, and what they'd recommend, especially with the eFlex. Yeah, so we do have a couple of questions here for very specific um, sizing questions. So if you can, yeah, definitely email tech support at fortresspower.com and they will absolutely help you with that. Uh, or Alex, email me directly. Or Alex directly, yes. Um, warranty in Bahamas? Ooh, a good question. It, 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 warranty in Bahamas. I'm gonna say five years to be safe. I am not sure if the Bahamas is a US territory, um, but if you send a message to sales at Fortress, I'll have my Latin American sales rep get in touch with you and he can confirm that. Okay, uh, one more from Sergio. Can I connect an eFlex 5.4 directly to my modem? Not directly, no. I would not recommend that. I would recommend that you connect your modem to the inverter, because if you connect it directly to the eFlex, um, you know, there's, no, there's not gonna be any charging rate or anything. It's just gonna push current into your modem and you wouldn't want you know, to, to harm your modem in any way. So use the inverter, connect your modem to. Okay, Robert is asking, is there much of a penalty for charging from AC to DC and back to AC, such as with an existing M-phase microinverter system? There's not really a penalty. You might lose a percentage of two of efficiency, but there's not really a, a penalty per se. Um, it's just, you know, converting it from AC to DC to AC, you will lose efficiency in all those transfers. Um, so not really a penalty, but you will lose a little bit of efficiency. Mark is asking, what was the bus bar you were mentioning? The bus bar is essentially a long metal pole that you can land your connections on for batteries. Um, look up like Reliance, R-E-L-I-A-N-C-E, Reliance bus bar. It's like a, it's a, it's a rated 1000 amp piece of metal essentially that you can land your connections on so you're not paralleling a bunch of batteries together. Mark said, got it, thank you. Welcome. All right, I believe that concludes our questions for today. Uh, everybody is going to be receiving a copy of this um, webinar in a link to your YouTube channel. So it's gonna be recorded and you will get a copy of all the slides. So if you missed anything or if there's anything that you would want uh, to repeat, you'll be able to do that tomorrow. All right, and uh, thank you very much for everybody who joined us and thanks for Alex and Daniel and we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody, thanks Daniel. Thank you.